Okay, gang. Hope you enjoy that little uh, music intro there. So, how can we make our students? Thank you, ACDC, Thunderstruck. Thunderstruck about what we are teaching. So, they are actually going to be able to learn it, retain it, and apply it. And that's what we're going to cover in this chapter principles of learning. Now, I do apologize, this can get a little dry. <laughs> And the intro is probably going to be about the most exciting thing uh, that uh, we're going to cover in this chapter. But let's dive into it. Principles of Learning. Again, my name is Adam Roberts here at Athens Technical College Fire Science Program. Welcome to FRSC 1132. Again, if you have any questions, feel free to email me at aroberts at athenstech.edu or you can give me a call in the office at 706-357-0162. So our first objective, describe the foundations of learning. And there have been oodles of educational psychologists that have done all kind of extensive research on how humans learn and remember information. And this section covers just a few of these research areas that explain how instruction methods and techniques can influence and affect learning from our students. So as an instructor, you should be aware that this field is, is always changing and they're learning new things about different learning methods. So this will give you a, a sound base or principle to operate from. So you can try to incorporate many of these different learning styles into whatever class you are teaching. Because as we know, not everybody learns the same way. And we're going to go through these different learning theories and give suggestions on how to incorporate them into the subjects that you are teaching. The first theory we're going to talk about is sensory stimulation theory. Now, sensory stimulation theory basically states that there is a lifelong reliance on the five senses as the primary tool set for learning. Now, according to this theory, people can only change their behavior or knowledge base by engaging the five senses. You know, and what we're talking about senses, you know, sound, sight, touch, uh, smell, and taste. And that may be a little difficult uh, to incorporate uh, in some of our fire service classes. However, uh, to continue on with this, people learn very little through the remaining senses other than sight. Now, sight takes the most information with hearing next. However, I do argue a little bit because, you know, when you were a, a kid and, you know, your parents told you, oh, don't touch that, it's hot, don't touch it, it's hot, well, until you actually touched it and you had that nice burning sensation, did you really kind of equate what hot was? And you remember that based off that, you know, feeling that you got from, you know, burning the bejesus out of your fingers or whatever the case may be, maybe your tongue, mouth, <laughs> whatever the case. So students pay more attention to sensory experiences than they do to the mental process or some sort of emotional involvement. Now, a sensory stimulus is either important enough to remember, so it's such commonplace, often it's disregarded or unimportant enough that it is forgotten. And what that basically is telling us is, you know, we learn every day from our senses and it becomes second nature. And sometimes we kind of forget about using this as a learning tool. And when we're thinking about sensory theory, 
the best way to kind of equate it is it's a mental storage system for attention getting stimulus or input. So your your brain basically acts as a file cabinet and it starts taking all this information, all this data it gets from your senses in any given situation and it starts putting it in this file cabinet of memories. And when you experience that sense again, it triggers a response on, hey, this happened. So a lot of times in the fire service, you'll, you'll start putting two and two together as a new firefighter. For example, let's use the sense of smell. We all know that there is a very distinct smell difference between the different types of objects that are burning whether it be some sort of oil-based product like tires or some sort of wood-based product like brush, limbs, and paper. They each have a very distinct smell and you start recalling, okay, hmm, I, I smell this very pungent, you know, oil-based kind of smell thing. Oh, wait, yeah, I remember that. That's when tires were burning or diesel fuel was burning. And that's kind of basically how the sensory theory works, again, based off of memories in your Rolodex and how you assimilate them into your life. Now, some of the flaws in this theory is it is difficult to attend to more than one stimulus at a time and remember it well. So basically what they're saying is, when you experience something and equate it to something, it's only going to link probably to one of your senses as opposed to more than one. Now, in the fire and emergency service, the sensory stimulation approach has evolved and has been more accurately defined using the next theory, the cone of learning. And before we get there, here is the five cents learning percentages. So you may want to remember these, hint, 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 cough, cough, cough. 75% uh, of seeing, 13% of hearing, and 12% of all the others combined. So our cone of learning. Now this cone illustrates the approximate amount of information retained. Again, it's very important to remember these percentages. Now, the cone basically states that 10% of what you read, you'll remember. 20% of what you hear, you'll remember. So basically, by just listening to this lecture, you're only going to remember about two words in 10. Now, 30% is what you have seen, and 50% is what you have seen and heard. So hopefully by listening to this, looking at the PowerPoint, you know, you'll remember about five out of 10 things I have said. So maybe I should say, remember all the percentages uh, five more times or at least 10 times, so you'll at least uh, have a 50% chance of remembering it. Now, the next one is 70% of what is said and repeated. So, what you have basically heard, saw, and now you start it repeating it and saying it over and over again, you're going to remember seven out of 10 words, basically 70%. And then the, the grand kudal here, the most, is 90% involves saying and actually doing it. So for example, when we're teaching a skill, a lot of times we have our students say each step as they're doing it, so they'll remember approximately 
percent of it and this is broken down into um, active and passive participation and passive basically means you're not really doing a whole lot you're just kind of being a vegetable sitting there and active basically means that the learner the student is participating in it whether it be actually doing the skill or repeating what the skill is so what's our important takeaway here the more your student is involved the higher percentage of information they're going to retain and that's what the cone learning is basically telling us the more you can get the student active performing saying and doing and repeating the more they're going to remember Now, many of our learners in fire service are adult learners, and we would be remiss if we didn't talk about Knowles, Dr. Malcolm Knowles. And he was one of the first American theorists to use the term androgy, which basically refers to the art of teaching adults. It is described that characteristics of adult students and provides a set of assumptions for the most effective method for teaching our adults and that's dealing with self-concept experiences readiness to learn learning orientation and motivation now the theory of androgy is now widely accepted in academia for teaching adults so self-concept that basically is a principle that states adults need to be self-directed while still relying on an instructor or a training course to provide the knowledge they desire basically adults don't like to be micromanaged okay they want to be saying okay this is what you need to do this is how you get there and i'm here to help so they still have that fallback of the instructor, but they're giving the independence to take care of what they need done. Next, we have experience. And adults have accumulated an extensive and varied quantities of experiences. And this serves as a resource for them to which they can relate new information. They also have more personal experiences to contribute to the learning process than children. So basically adult learners, in theory, have learned a lot in their years walking around on this earth. And the way they learn is to be able to take this new information and apply it to something that they relate to or that they have already learned. So it's basically adding another level to an experience that they have dealt with or done. So let's talk for a second about this. Now, as a kid, young adult, and even older adult, We've had some experience with fire in terms of starting a campfire, a fireplace, or maybe uh, the skills of a misguided youth, a cigarette lighter, a firecracker, gasoline fertilizer, whatever the case may be. Uh, I won't tell you my uh, own stories there on that. But um, we can relate the term pyrolysis in fire behavior to that of starting a fire. So we talk to our students and we explain, you know, the fire tetrahedron and what all you need to start a fire, but they start with the basis of, okay, I remember starting a campfire. I, I took some sticks, I took some uh, dry stuff, uh, some paper, crumbled it up, 
stuck the wood around it, lit the paper, it began to burn, and eventually it would catch fire. So they have that basis to work with already. And then we apply the theory of pyrolysis and we ask them, okay, why is this wood burning? What is actually burning? And then you start talking in about pyrolysis, how uh, everything will burn given it reaches a certain temperature where the material itself or the matter starts breaking down and it starts changing from that solid or liquid to a gaseous state. And it's actually the fumes that are what is burning. So that is an excellent example of how experience is brought into the classroom to help our students learn a new concept. Next, we have readiness to learn. Now, adults are ready to learn whatever they need to know or to do in order to meet job requirements or social roles. So basically, hey, I'm ready to learn. I know I need this for my job. You know, they've got that motivation there to get it done. Next, we have learning orientation. Now, adult learning orientation is problem-centered because they have a specific purpose for learning and want skills or knowledge that can be applied to real life problems or situations. So I like to equate learning orientation for our adult learners on, okay, why is this important? And a lot of learners need to know that. Okay, why do I need to know this? And, you know, sometimes motivation for a job or because I said so, uh, it's not really going to help drive the point home. So if you can put that hook in early on why we need to know this, it'll help prime the student and get them ready to go and learn. And that feeds right into our motivation. You know, adults have internal incentives or motivations and are motivated to learn by such factors as increased self-esteem, resulting from successful completion of the process, and a goal. So, you know, motivation could be, hey, if I learn this, I'll pass, I'll get my fire certification, I'll get my EMT certification, which means I can get out of my current job that I may or may not like, or I can pay the bills, I can get the new car, whatever the case may be. So again, motivation. What motivates your students? Why are they there? And that's something good to get a feel from your students at the start of class. You know, are they being voluntold to be there or do they want to be there for some other reason? Career advancement, knowledge, maybe they're young and idealistic in the profession and, you know, they want to know a little bit about everything so they can better do their job. So find out what the motivation is and then try to incorporate that again into what you are teaching. Now we come to good old Thorndike, Thorndike's Law of Learning. Now, the laws of learning, as theorized by Edward L. Thorndike, suggest that there are certain laws or traits of adult learners that can be used to effectively instruct adult students. Now, instructors need to understand these laws to lead adult education. And here are the four laws, readiness, exercise, effect, and disuse. So readiness, adult students must be prepared to learn and must place themselves in a state where they are mentally and physically able to learn new technology or skills. So are they ready? You know, are they awake? Do they have their morning coffee? Um, do they have their books? Is the seat comfortable? Is the environment okay? Is it too hot, too cold? 
You know, is everything there ready for them to learn? Are they in that right frame of mind to start learning? Now, in the Fire and Emergency Service, adult students recognize that the information they will receive is necessary and important to the success and safety of the mission. However, there may be barriers to readiness, such as um, attending a class after an all-night shift. You know, a lot of times that happens. Or... Um, Maybe they're worried about catching a call or, or they've got, you know, some other external factors going on. So, again, try to keep this stuff in mind and help the student be ready to learn. You know, if they've had a late shift where they're coming in, they got off at 7, your class starts at 8, and they've been up all night fighting fire, they might not be too ready to, uh, to learn. So, again, you may want to get them to stand up, do a few jumping jacks, pour the coffee down them and uh, take frequent breaks. The next law has to do with exercise. And this is a big one, gang. Adult learns best when they're allowed to exercise the skill. The more an act is practiced, the faster and sure learning becomes. Therefore, as an instructor, you should include as much time as possible for adult learners to practice whatever concept and skill that you're going over. And with exercise, that's kind of a hard thing to gauge on time because each student is different. I've had groups where they were just jam up, you showed it one time, they practiced it for 10 minutes, and they got it. They were good to go. And I've had other groups where, you know, it was a 50-50, where some picked it up great, others needed more practice. So, again, you have to be flexible and be able to adjust your training schedule to ensure the objectives are met. And there are other things you can do to help, like, you know, get the students that are or better at it, or got a good concept on it to help the slower ones um, make a game out of it, whatever the case may be. And they keep practicing it until they get it. Now, next is effect. And adult learners need to see the positive effect of what they're learning. Now, the effect could be the satisfaction of learning the new skill or mastering new uh, information, or it could be just, um, you know, Give them a pat on the back saying, hey, great job. You know, I, I, I'm glad you got that. Um, you're doing great and giving that positive feedback. Um, some people say with a younger generation now that, you know, they all get a ribbon for participation and they need that, you know, positive feedback that they're doing a good job. Um, so that may be something that you need to incorporate. Again, looking at the dynamics of the age group in your class, and again, touching on the different attributes of each generation in terms of how they respond and, of course, how they learn. Now, you may have uh, a different generation that, hey, you know, they're just happy learning the skill. You know, they don't give a two um sense about a, a pat on the back or oh here's my ribbon for finishing first or whatever the case may be next theory or i shall say law has to do with this use and i like bringing this up because when you're doing continuing education or review of skills that a learner should have already learned in the class, you need to keep this in mind. So basically, this use states in a nutshell, if you don't use it, you lose it. Okay. The longer you go without practicing a skill or doing something, the weaker it becomes and the harder it gets to be to bring it back up to the top and do the skill correctly. 
Next, we have association. And again, a lot of these theories kind of overlap, but with association, that again is referring to what have I already learned and applying new information to it. Recency, which basically states, hey, skills and information practice or learn more most recent are also the best remember. Now, for example, adult learners may not remember the information on a certification test years after passing it if they don't use the information in the intervening years. Again, that goes back to disuse. So as an instructor, you need to recognize when skills or information have fallen to disuse and you may need to do a review. So for example, maybe you're doing a, a confined space class and you're teaching them more advanced knots, but they need to remember those basic knots that they learned in Firefighter 1. You know, your clove hitch, your bowling, your figure eight, your figure eight on a bite, uh, Beckett, or sheep men and things of that nature. So you may need to build in time to practice these things a bit at the beginning of class before you start dumping on new information. Uh, another great example of recency is if you are studying for a final that's cumulative over say all the parts of this textbook, what do you study first? The stuff in chapter one or the stuff in the last chapter. And based off this theory, and this goes into the next one with uh, primacy, but you start what you have just learned because that's easier to retain and you make sure you perfect it and then you start working your way back. Now, primacy assumes that the first of the series of learned acts is remember better than others. So it's pretty similar to recency, but it's kind of a dichotomy, basically stating that, okay, recency, you remember the last thing first. Primacy states that you're going to remember what you learn first and not so much later because the information um, is newer and you're interested in it. So with this effect in mind, instructors should begin each lesson with a strong overview of content, including your learning objectives and major concepts that you want them to learn that will be covered throughout the overall training. So again, primacy, you start with a big bang, you tell them what they need to know, here are the critical concepts, it's kind of like an abstract, this is why we need to learn it, then you start going into the nuts and bolts throughout your lesson, and then in your conclusion or your summary, that's kind of when you reiterate with recency and again, review those key concepts. So that's a way to incorporate both of those into your class. Next, we have intensity. And intensity refers back to experiences or stimulus. So the more intense or possibly lifelike you can make the training, the better your students will remember it. And there is a lot of debate now in the fire service on live fire training and are we making it realistic enough or have we made it so uh, safe that the students are developing complacency in it and they think of it as second nature and not a big deal and they're gonna run into trouble once they get on a fire scene. So let's think about it. You have a brand new firefighter, new recruit. You send them through fire school. They get to live fire training. They've done the fire extinguisher. They did the ground cover fire. We put them in a burn building. We walked them through the burn building. They know all the exits, the windows. And now we 
put just straw in there and pallets. We light them on fire. They've got an instructor in there, a gazillion backup hose lines. And what happens every time they go into that building? The fire goes out, right? The fire goes out. Hopefully nobody ever gets hurt. And they back out and then they do it again and again and again and again. And they have the same results. So, by having the safer training environment, again, the argument is, are we lacking in intensity and causing complacency in our students and fighting fire? And again, that's a debate. Uh, and that's something that, you know, you'll have to address as you're conducting a class and within your department. And that's just something to keep in mind. But in terms of intensity, the more lifelike you can make it, the more likely they're going to remember it as opposed to that of a lecture or a video in terms of how to perform a skill. Maslow's Hierarchy of Needs presents a five-stage hierarchy to explain human motivation. Now, psychologist Maslow published the concept in 1943 in an academic paper titled A Theory of Human Motivation. And this really hasn't changed much, and it's still being taught today, obviously, because we're going over it. But in terms of regular uh, academia and teaching teachers and your traditional four-year institutions. So the five basic levels of Maslow's theory are identified as follows. Level one, psychological or biological needs are met, such as hey, you got to have air, you got to have water, food, shelter, warmth, sleep, etc. And until a person is reasonably satisfied with these needs, the focus will always be on satisfying these needs and will not progress. So until they have you know, again, all those basic needs taken care of, they're not going to be in the right frame of mind to learn. Next, we have safety, which is a need for security, order, stability, law, and freedom of fear. Again, if you're scared of doing something, it may be hard to learn or be prepared to learn. Excellent example. So you have a student that is deathly afraid of heights. So how are you going to make them secure so they can learn how to operate on an elevated master stream or a ladder doing a high angle rescue? And again, those are some things you got to think about. Now, it may be something as simple as Maybe you just put them in the bucket of a ladder truck on the ground and then you raise them up and you have somebody up there with them talking with them and you let them stay up there for so long at a time, you know, five minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe up to 30 minutes or an hour or you have them sitting on a roof just looking until they start developing some sense of security or stability in terms of the safety. Next, we have social, and social is that, that primal, that basic need to belong to a social group, to be accepted, loved, and valued. So if you're kind of the outcast or the black sheep, it may be hard for you to get in that motivation to learn because you're not in the group. And maybe that's why when we're doing a recruit school or, or or teaching new skills that we like doing group work. You know, everybody likes doing things in a group. And there's, you know, multiple reasons for that, I believe, but it could quite definitely be 
we're meeting this social need to be in a group and accept it and working toward a common goal as opposed to, you know, the lone wolf. Next, we have esteem. And this is that need to achieve and master and get the respect and the prestige and be just dominant on a skill that, hey, you know what? I'm better than you. I'm the best firefighter, whatever the case may be. Maybe that's why people have that urge to go be a smoke diver or whatever the case may be, uh, to be the best, uh, to meet that esteem need. And then we have self actualization, which is that need to seek self fulfillment, that personal growth and peak or accumulating experiences. You know, that, that self realization that, hey, I've done it. I'm at the top of the pyramid. I've got this. Now, Maslow postulated that all people are capable of reaching that higher level, but life circumstances or other considerations may derail them in that progress or process. In a training environment, this theory explains why a student may not perform well in a classroom setting when he or she is unable to meet the lowest level of requirements. So again, if you're sitting in class and you don't have that psychological uh, needs met, the safety or social, you know, you're not going to make it to esteem or, or that self actualization because you're so consumed with the basics at the pyramid. Objective number two, differentiate among the different domains of learning. Now, domains of learning refers to interrelated areas in which learning occurs. When the domains are used together, a student is encouraged to understand a concept, perform a task, and ultimately alter a behavior. And a lot of people say that learning is equated to a change in behavior. You haven't really learned something unless you change what you're doing. So what are our different domains of learning? And that has to do with three different learning domains. We have cognitive, which is our knowledge, the domain that encompasses what information a student needs to learn. Then we have psychomotor, which is basically your skills. This is the domain that encompasses how a student should apply the knowledge. And the effective or attitude is the domain that encompasses why the information is useful. So what, how, and why? What do I need to know? How do I need to do it? And why? You answer those three questions in your lesson, again, you stand a greater chance of reaching more students at actually achieving that change in behavior or that learning that you want to accomplish. So let's repeat this again, because this is important stuff. Having an understanding, see how I, I, I pull that in there, we're repeating. So what law or theory does that have to do with gang? Hint, hint, hint. Having an understanding of these domains and how they interact will assist the instructor in presenting effective instruction. Remember, 
cognitive domain, students gain understanding about a concept or a topic, psychomotor, students perform the skill associated with the concept, and the affective domain, the student develops a willingness to perform the behavior correctly and safely. So when I think of cognitive, I basically think of the book stuff. Okay, this is the stuff you're going to read, uh, look at presentations, videos, lectures, and discussion format. That is your knowledge. Now, instructors may use the following resources and techniques to describe and illustrate this cognitive material. Now, when you're doing this, the more interesting and dynamic you can make it, the more apt that they're going to remember it. So use instructional technologies, tools, and training aids, whether it be videos, props, such as models, have people demonstrate it, watch videos on the demonstration, and even involve the students in application of the activity. So maybe you're sitting in the class, we're going over the cognitive stuff, you watch a video on how to operate a fire extinguisher, and then you demonstrate how to do it. And then you bring uh, a group of students up and maybe you bring the two class clowns up or the, the ones that are a little on the shy side to get them involved, the ones that you know are, are trying to fall asleep. And then you have them demonstrate it slowly with you critiquing the skill in front of the other students. So our hands-on training, our psychomotor component. And again, knowledge is gained in the cognitive domain, and then it is transferred to physical movement or psychomotor. Now, learning is developed, again, through repeated practice of the skill. And we can go back and again and look at our cone of learning and all and know that, yep, the more we actually practice and do it, the better chances are that we're going to remember it and retain it. Now, successful completion of a skill is measured in such things as speed. We all may remember the first time we put on our turnout gear and you had to put on your turnout gear and have an SCBA on and breathe in air in two minutes. Now, the first few times you did it, what was your speed like? Did you make it in two minutes? Mm, probably not. And did you have some missteps? Quite possible. Maybe you forgot a Velcro or you had skin showing. So successful completion of the skill is measured in your speed, your precision, your distance, your adherence to known techniques, and the sequence of execution. You know, did you do it? in order did you do it quickly enough did you hit all the check marks and as a student is practicing the psychomotor this hands-on skill through positive reinforcement and continue practice the student will develop that correct technique and become more proficient so the skill becomes a habit that is performed automatically. So we're talking muscle memory here. The more you practice this skill, the easier it becomes, where you don't even have to think about it. You can do it without even looking at it. And a good example would be maybe tying a bow in. You have them practice, 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 then you, you know, have them put on gloves, practice, 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 and then it becomes such second nature that you have them practice and tie it behind their back or not looking at it. And again, that is a way of that muscle memory where they're not even thinking about it, they're just doing it. Now, as an instructor, you need to be aware that again, students learn at different rates and speeds and have different levels of ability. So you have to factor that in when you are planning out the time necessary for skill practice. 
And maybe you don't have all the time where you can make sure everybody can get it 100%. I don't know. It, it, it depends. So maybe it'd be a case where you have a student that's just not getting it and you need to move on. So you have that student meet with you after class, you sign a mentor or whatever the case may be. But again, that goes back to understanding why are they not getting it? Why are they having a hard time? and finding out what the problem is and coming up with an appropriate solution. Now, overall, again, before students move on to the next level or skill, they need to be comfortable with that first step. Some students may want to observe longer than others before they actually begin to practice. Again, it depends on the student and others may want more guidance and coaching before feeling confident to work on their own. Again, different students, different levels and, and, and different things. So you need to keep all this in mind when you're doing your skill practice. And a good way to demonstrate this step here I go back to algebra and some of you guys are cringing right now and I understand, but you can't do algebra unless you've learned the previous steps. So for example, um, order of operations, you know, or fractions and decimals or division, you know, you have to learn all those basics before you start solving for X. So, you know, 3x equals 18 solve for x. Well, if you don't understand the concept of division, you know, dividing x by 3 and 18 by 3, you're never going to be able to solve for x equals 6. And if I got that wrong, I apologize. So everybody's breaking out their calculator right now. So with our skills, we've already beat a dead horse on about our time, but it's kind of interesting to note that studies suggest with hands-on training or vocational training, students, all students given enough time, will master each level of the skill Again, provided that they have enough time to do so. So I always encourage error on the side of caution and add more time than you think you need to teach a skill. So now on to the effective or attitude. How individuals deal with issues emotionally. And that has to do with self-awareness, their attitudes, their interest, their appreciation, their motivation, enthusiasm, and values. Now, the instructor influences students' perception of the merits of a class, institution, or environment when they demonstrate it, such as attitudes toward authority, respect, responsibility, and safety, among other values. When an instructor's attitude is positive, your students will place a higher value on these qualities and resources. Again, you need to be a role model. You know, you want them to grow and exude the, these characteristics of a good firefighter, officer, driver, whatever the case may be. And if you're not excited about it or you have a sloppy appearance uh, or really negative, then the student will have a low regard for these values. Thus, you're turning out a crappy product and we don't want a crappy product because that could lead to somebody getting hurt injured or killed 
Now, learning outcomes of the affected domain take time to achieve, and a lot of times they're not readily observable as a result of the cognitive or psychomotor domains. So while learning new cognitive information and performing the new skills, students may alter old attitudes, values, and beliefs. So a good example would be we preach, you know, you're working with ladders, make sure you at least have, you know, hat, hands, and feet, or whatever the case may be for your safety gear. You wear your helmet, and you wear your helmet appropriately with the chin straps on, and you always have your gloves. Well, you may not see that attitude change until after they're out of the class. And then you see them working in the field, and you notice that, hey, you know, they don't have their helmet on like the old salty firefighters in terms of they got that cool chin strap dangling down maybe they got their ear flaps tucked up in the helmet uh, they're actually doing it correctly and being safe you know they've got their chin strap buckled and tight they've got their ear flaps down and they're doing what they're supposed to do and again they have that attitude that change in behavior so you have effectively affected their affective uh, learning domain. Boy, that's a, a mouthful. Objective number three, explain student diversity and how it affects instruction in the learning environment. Student diversity is one factor that will contribute to a learning environment. And some examples they list here are life experiences, responsibilities, motivation, time demand, responsibilities, confidence, and learner characteristics and differences. So how does this affect you as an instructor? And basically, you have to learn to relate to your students, and again, in terms of what's going on in their life, so you can be able to communicate more effectively with them. And you have to understand that certain groups, certain people, uh, certain things may take offense to certain leadership styles or certain hand gestures, or, or certain comments. So again, you need to be mindful of your students and try to find out as much as you can about their background, who they are, and even, you know, age, because each age group and ethnicity and even gender plays a big role in how these people learn. And we'll go more into this. Now, adult students possess a variety of life experiences that are gained through work, leisure, and family responsibilities. As said, instructors should use discussion techniques to help students establish their own connection between their past experiences and the new material being taught. Now, these discussions help to involve students in the learning process and allow the instructor to determine the gap between what students already know and what they need to know fulfill the needs of their job and to learn the new skill. Now, motivation is an interesting topic as we talked about. Sometimes they're motivated by internal or external forces, meaning they have their own personal motivation or they have external motivations such as family, finances, um, their employer, or whatever the case may be. And you also have to think about self-confidence. Some students in our course are very confident about their ability to learn. And you may have other students that may be ready to learn but are unfamiliar with the subject matter. And still in other cases, students may have been aware, or excuse me, been away from school for quite some time. So they may have little confidence in their abilities to successfully pass 
upon prior negative learning experiences. Maybe they weren't so good in high school or college or wherever the case may be. So they may be real timid on trying to interact with the group, answer questions, and do what they need to do for fear of failure. So that's something that you need to be able to put them at ease about. Again, that whole safety aspect in terms of preparing them for learn and making sure that those basic needs are met. And again, here's a whole list of different diverse issues that you may come in contact with. Age, obviously, gender, culture, educational background. You may have some individuals with a bachelor's, master's, and some with a GED. You may have different physical capabilities. Some may be able to run two miles in a blink of an eye, and others may take two days. And you may even run into some other sensitive uh, issues, such as sexual orientation. And you may have to deal with those in the classroom setting. Students should be respected for their abilities, their experiences, and their own individuality, as well as their willingness to learn and perform. Increased student diversity brings a diversity of thought to the instructional environment, which in turn enhances learning. So again, if you can get these different opinions, different backgrounds from all these different groups and sources about a subject you're discussing, that tends to really facilitate a great discussion on whatever topic you're talking about. And the more you discuss it, and feel them at ease, the more the learning environment takes place and the more engaged your student becomes. Adults of different generations may have different experiences and skill sets that they bring to the learning environment. One generation may be more hands-on with the understanding of machinery, tools, and construction, while others may be more tech savvy. So instructors should take these differences into account and ask students what a particular strength are to assess and assist other students who have less experience. So case in point, you may have an older generation that you know grew up operating chainsaws and heavy machinery and things of that nature. I know when I was coming along, um, it was nothing for dad to say, okay, here's a chainsaw, go forth and do good and don't cut your leg off. And that may not have been the best way uh, to teach chainsaw safety. Uh, but it, it's something that, you know, you learned and you became comfortable with in terms of, you know, sawing up firewood or cutting down pine trees or things of that nature. Now, you may have a more tech-savvy generation now that really has no clue on how to start a chainsaw or, you know, operate a choke or fuel shut off or is it a type of uh, motor that requires two cycle oil like a weed eater or just regular gasoline um, like a lawnmower. So again, age plays a big part in tailoring your, your lesson. You can't assume for granted that you know it, that everybody knows it. Different genders bring their own unique experiences to the classroom and training grounds. And as we primarily know, uh, in firefighting, it's primarily a male profession, but we are getting a lot more females into the profession. And of course, their experiences should be welcomed and their strengths should be brought into the fold so we can better complete our mission and become a more rounder, better department mirroring the community in which we serve. Students may bring gender bias to the learning environment, which may affect their relationship with the instructor. Other students' perception of the instructor and the learning process as well. Allowing gender bias to enter a learning environment is very disruptive to effective instruction. Now, these differences may lead to class discussion, but should not derail the entire topic of the class.
Individuals from different cultural and ethical backgrounds bring unique customs, behaviors, and attitudes and values to learning environment. As the instructor, you need to recognize and understand the situation in which ethical and cultural difference may have an effect on classroom instruction or student interaction. Because of the diverse group of individuals who participate in training courses, it is not always possible for an instructor to be familiar with the customs of every culture and ethnic group. Instructors should regularly seek out and attend diversity training courses and opportunities because their customs, behaviors, attitudes, and values can be totally different from yours or the norm of the group. Okay, so let's tie some of this together. Learning styles and learning characteristics. So let's recap. A learning style is the consistent way a person gathers and processes information. Students in the learning environment use sight, hearing, and touch to gather information. Students will favor one or a combination of these senses individually. Now, students may not be aware that they use any particular style to participate in learning, nor that they may use different learning styles for different tasks or circumstances. So you as an instructor may want to do a learning style test or a quiz. You can find them online very easily to see what type of learning style you are and then give that to your students to see what the majority favors and that could help you um, dictate your lesson plans. Instructors can recognize the different learning styles in the, in the way of their individual students. Perceive, remember, and think about information and solve problems. And again, this is by paying close attention to how your students act. You can also see and make sense of their world and attend to their environment, as well as attend to instruction and participate in activities. The differences are all representative of different learning styles based on which sense or combination of senses provide students with the most accurate amount of information that is acceptable to them. To meet different learning styles, instructors should plan a variety of teaching methods and learning activities in their lesson. So, you know, you may want to incorporate hands-on skills, videos, maybe some sort of computer savvy, something or another, old-fashioned crossword puzzles, worksheets, you know, whatever the case may be, to try to hit all these different learning styles so that all your students can and will be successful. Of course, we've got to keep in mind that some students have developed bad learning styles that are counterproductive and can even contribute to their failure. And they are often not aware that their studying and learning habits aren't working. You know, maybe it's uh, a person that waits to the last minute to do everything or Maybe they're not familiar with remembering vocabulary words or bold text. So maybe you should go over, you know, studying techniques before you start a recruit school or some long term class and go through maybe the first chapter together and have them read it out loud in class, taking turns, and then discussing key points and having people, you know, highlight what they feel is or is not important and what they really need to remember and what's just good information and that would be a good way to start developing new and good habits for those learners again that may have developed bad habits or haven't been in school for quite some time self-regulated learning some students will indicate a preference to regulate their learning environment to take advantage of their own skills focus and direction 
Um, this is that uh, independent student that says, hey, you know what? Just tell me what you want done and when you want it done by and I'll make it happen. So when an instructor is able to accommodate the self-regulation, a student can set their own goals, learn content, and provide feedback to the instructor independent of the rest of the class. Now, these are traditionally your real bright students that just get bored quickly and, and jump ahead and, and just want to be done with it. And they get bored uh, and with you know the pace of the class if it's too, quote, slow for them. So you may want to take these self-regulated learners and give them additional tasks within the class to help occupy their time as well as to help facilitate the learning environment. Maybe you assign them a slower student or, or something of that nature. Now these students are also very inquisitive and they may go beyond the depth and breadth or the scope of what you're trying to teach and they may thirst for more information. So you may want to again give them the resources so they can dig a little deeper into the topic as long as they've of course mastered the basics. It is important to note that you don't want these students to monopolize the class and speed because you have your other students that may not be as quick and just get blown away and feel like, oh my God, I'm lost. I'm, I'm never going to catch up why I'm even here. So you've got to balance those fast paced learners again with the speed of the whole class as a whole and, and the slower learners as well. On to learning objective number four. Summarize interpersonal communication, purpose, elements, and components. Now, when you're talking about interpersonal communication, we're talking about such things as informal language, informal nonverbal clues, frequent changes of the speaker and listener role, spontaneity, formality, you know, command versus discussion, and intensity, such as tone, pitch, and volume. The tone of the conversation can change based on the perception of the two parties. Therefore, it is important that all individuals understand and master the skills involved in interpersonal communication. And here's a great chart in your book that talks about the classroom model of communication and how it transitions from the instructor to the student and back. Five general purposes for interpersonal communication. First is learning, which is acquiring knowledge or skill. Second is relating, establishing a new relationship or maintaining an existing one. Next, we have influencing, which is control, direct, or manipulating behavior. Playing, creative, a diversion and gain pleasure or gratification as with positive humor. And of course, helping, attend to another person's needs or console someone in a time of tragedy or loss. And these are all examples of interpersonal communication. So when you're communicating with someone, there are five basic elements they want you to understand. The first being the sender, or in our case, the instructor. And then you have the message, which is what you're sending out, such as the lesson. And then the receiver is the student or the person that is absorbing the message. And then you have feedback to the sender or the student asking questions, acknowledging that the message has been sent, and then we have interference. And interference can happen at any part here, but interference is basically a breakdown of the message. And this can be anything from too much information, uh, maybe they're 
butt is so sore that they can't absorb anymore. Maybe it's tone of voice. Maybe they can't hear. Maybe they can't see. Whatever the case may be. But there is for some reason something blocking the message that the sender is trying to send to the receiver, i.e. the student. Now in the classroom model of instruction, it is the instructor's responsibility to basically interpret or encode the information in the lesson plan so that the student will understand it when they send the message out to them. Now all communication takes place within a larger frame of reference, such as the sender encodes it and the receiver decodes it. Now the instructor must learn to encode the information at the student's level and not to include more information than is necessary. So you got to make sure that they're understanding what you're saying, that you're not using you know, too many big words that they may not understand. You got to make sure that they're able to uh, assimilate and understand the information. So as a receiver of the information, the students will attempt to decode what their instructor is saying to them. And then after decoding the message, students will relate it to what they already know and determine what is the meaning for them. Now, what happens a lot of times is ineffective encoding. So, for example, can you describe the communication model? And here's you, the instructor, yay! And you spent an hour chatting about it. You sent the message to the student. And now it's, oh my God, I don't understand it. So there was a breakdown in communication. Students respond to an instructor through feedback, and with the feedback, it may be verbal, such as students asking a question, or nonverbal. And nonverbal is something very easy to pick up on, but you got to look at your students. Do they appear bored, unmotivated? Are they looking at their phone? Are they looking outside? Um, are they goofing off with the person next to them? So when the instructor pays attention to the student feedback, they can modify the lesson to better serve the students. So if you see somebody's not paying attention, how do you bring them back in the fold? Do you ask them a question? Do you call them out? Do you try to bounce a dry erase marker off their head? Um, I don't know. Uh, those are all options. Some are better than others. But again, you need to adjust your delivery. Maybe you need to throw some action in there, drop a textbook, you know, get them up, move them around, try, try something. But get your students back engaged because clearly the message that you're encoding is not being decoded by the student. So try to figure out what the interference is. Why are they not getting the message? As an instructor, you can misinterpret a student's feedback as cues. Um, you may uh, equate it to a student not listening or an inappropriate use of some sort of electronic devices. So again, find out why your message is not getting across and then addressing the situation. So for communication to be effective, both the sender and the receiver must agree on its purpose. A shared situation usually creates this agreement. In some cases, the purpose must be explicitly stated to ensure that both parties understand it fully. So again, you're, you're maybe trying to explain something and you have to explain why it's important, why they need to know it, and again, get that buy-in from the student so you have their attention. 
when you're looking at your message, you got to think about the verbal component. So the instructor must understand both the power and the weakness of words as part of a message. The word is a message typically account for only a very small percentage of the overall total information communicated. However, the words in a message carry most of the abstract meaning in communication. For an instructor to communicate effectively, he or she must have some idea of the student's familiarity with the technical aspect of the class content. So, you know, you may be talking about something, but you do have to know where your students are coming from and you're choosing your word choice carefully and appropriately to convey the adequate meaning. And sometimes that can be really difficult if you have students that have English as a second language. Um, certain sarcasms and humors and, and things that we take for granted uh, may not translate well to those types of students. So when a subject is completely new to a student in a class, you need to be very limited in using industry terms or make sure that they understand the terms you're going to be using by clearly defining them to begin with. Avoid any technical language and fire service jargon when you're speaking to the public or elected officials, uh, such as media or outside professions, because again, our message may not be just fire service individuals. It may be public figures or community organization. So if we start talking shop, uh, our, our traditional you know, fire EMS type language, that can be considered offensive or gender bias or even racist to other non-groups that don't understand the culture and, and the meaning of things that again transpire. Uh, again, for example, uh, throwing out the term DRT, uh, dead right there. Um, in the classroom setting for people in the fire and EMS profession, they're not going to think uh, twice about it. But if you're talking to, again, public figures or the general public, they may take offense to using that term. So to help hone these verbal communication skills, there are a couple of recommendations. First, engage in dual perspective, meaning that understand that people are coming from different backgrounds, different point of views, and different ideas. Take responsibility for personal feelings and thoughts, meaning, okay, you can talk about something and say, okay, this is what the book says, this is what they think, however, this is how I feel, how do you feel, you know, and get the whole touchy-feely thing uh, going on, so to speak. But even though they may have an opinion that differs from your own or other students, you should show respect for the feelings and thoughts of the other person. You want to try to gain accuracy and clarity when you're speaking. And of course, be aware of any special needs of the receiver. Um, do they have a hard time hearing? Do they have a hard time seeing without glasses? Do they need to move closer? Do you need to have a microphone? Avoid speaking or addressing a problem while angry or otherwise experiencing strong emotions. So maybe somebody asked a real stupid question or what you deem as stupid. You've been talking about this for the past two hours and they asked a question that you covered 5,000 times. Well, you may want to take a break, collect yourself, and then address the question. Don't talk about the problem when you're, you know, high strung, you're still hot about it because it's going to lead to a breakdown in communication and you may start talking out of turn or saying things that you will later regret. As a rule of thumb, I always say, if it sounded good and felt good saying it, you probably shouldn't have said it and you should have waited uh, a few minutes and let things simmer down 
before moving forward and make sure that what you're trying to convey, you're actually conveying in the appropriate tone and time. Nonverbal components. Believe it or not, most of what is communicate between the sender and the receiver, whether it be the student talking or the instructor listening or vice versa, only 7% actually come from the words. 38% is with the vocal tone and inflection. So by emphasizing 38% when you speak, that vocal inflection is cluing the receiver end as saying, hey, this is something I need to pay attention to. Now, the rest, and this is a biggie if you think about it, gang, 55% of what you are communicating comes from body language. Whether you're sitting up there stiff as a board, maybe you have a student that's sitting there with their arms crossed and that sour look on their, pay, uh, on their puss, you know, it says a lot. And that's why I'm a firm believer in this day and age. I hate text messaging. People do it all the time. But again, you're only getting 7% from the words, so you're losing you know, a good 93% of the message because all you've got in a text message is the words. So it's very easy for someone to take offense to it. So when we're looking at our nonverbal components, we're talking again about vocal characteristics, pitch, tone, depth, breath. Uh, you know, how are you speaking? Uh, are you talking very quiet? Are you talking loud? Are you changing your pitch? You also have vocal interferences, such as, are you throwing in a lot of pregnant pauses or ums and other distracting things while you're trying to collect your thoughts? Eye contact. Eye contact is a big one. Are you looking at your students? Are you making eye contact in theory with everyone? Are you looking above them? Are you looking at the floor? You know, I had a geometry teacher in high school and I swear to God, the man spent the entire class staring at the ceiling as he was trying to convey uh, the geometry topic that he was talking about. So he didn't do well with eye contact. Facial expressions, you get a lot from facial expressions in terms of importance and what you're talking about, as well as gestures. And I'm a firm believer in gestures. I like gestures. I talk with my hands uh, just because that's who I am. However, making too many gestures can be very distracting. If all they see or are focusing on are you flailing your hands about from side to side and look like you're doing Richard Simmons jumping jacks wet into the oldies. Some of you will get that, some of you won't. Um, they're not going to pay attention to what you're saying. And if you don't know who Richard Simmons is and sweating the oldies, hit up the old Google machine and you'll get a good laugh. Uh, I'm talking about the 80s here. Personal appearance. How does the instructor look? Are you going to convey confidence in teaching if you look like Fido's ass? You know, if you're trying to give a lecture on grooming and here you come in and, you know, your hair's not washed, you need to brush your teeth, uh, your uniform's all ragged, uh, how much stock are they going to take in what you're saying? Posture, and this is both on the receiver and sender, but what's the posture like? Are you standing up straight? Is the person, you know, slouching in their chair? Are they hovering over the desk uh, about an inch away from hitting the snooze button? What about poise and proximity? You know, people have that whole 
bubble, you know, that personal space. And you have some people that we swear, you know, don't have that whole uh, personal space thing. So they get too, too close. And then your student becomes feeling unsafe. And it's like, okay, back off. You're too close. And the whole proximity thing becomes an issue. Touch is another component. Now, sometimes, you know, a touch may be good in terms to bring some somebody back in the fold very quietly and discreetly. So, for example, you start walking around the room by getting closer to people. They're going to start cluing in. Or maybe you just put your hand down on the desk close by, and then that again will will clue them in. Or maybe you need to touch the hand or something in guiding a skill. So touch can be a good thing, but you've also got to be careful because touch can be misconstrued as a thousand different things and make someone feel uncomfortable. Now, you probably don't want to go up in class and you know slap a big hug on somebody while you're giving a lecture or start massaging their shoulder because they're going to start having raised eyebrows and next thing you know, you're going to be writing a letter, dear chief, and end up in the, uh, the principal's office, so to speak. So we talked about communicating and, and the different verbal and nonverbal components, and there's a whole lot of information out there. And feel free to look up more on this. It's a wealth of knowledge out there, and it could definitely help you with your presentations. So now let's turn our focus on not only do we need to be able to communicate, but we need to be able to listen. Because as we saw in our model, in order to get a message across, you got to have feedback, right? You encode it, you send it to the student, they decode it, they send it back to you in the form of feedback, and then you have to decode that message and make sure they understand. So how do you decode what they're saying to you? And this goes into listening, or what we call uh, active listening, an actual hearing what a person is saying. So when we look at the active process of listening, we have several different components, such as attending, understanding, remembering, evaluating, and responding. So when you're listening to someone, you want to pay total attention to them. You don't want to be distracted looking at your phone. You want to maintain eye contact, and you want to try to focus on what they're saying. So a good way to practice this, of course, is listening to recordings or speeches or stories or lectures about instructional techniques and practice taking notes at you know, meetings and in the classes, attend speeches or presentations, and try to minimize internal and external distractions. So again, when you're trying to listen to somebody, try to tune out maybe other distracting conversations that are going on or not really be thinking about internal issues like, okay, I'm listening to what you're saying, but what I'm really thinking about is, what am I going to have for lunch today? Which is a quite a good question because I am recording this at lunchtime. But I am listening even though I am just uh, yakking you guys on a, on a video here. So let's talk about some learning obstacles and learning plateaus. Students who are struggling to learn new material may become frustrated, which of course further distracts them from the learning process. So you must realize that some students may need additional help to get over this hurdle to learn the skills. Now, the breakdown could also be such um, things as uh, stressors or situations that can undermine their own success in terms of worried about grades, finances, and things of that nature. And you may want to refer them to, you know, employee assistance program or some sort of counseling service to make sure, again, that those basic needs are met so they're ready to learn. 
Now, once an instructor discovers the underlying cause, they may be able to help the student resolve some of these frustrations. And again, depending on what it is, know what your resources are out there and where to find the appropriate help. Some students need assistance from the instructor to, of course, overcome these learning obstacles or plateaus. And that can be in the form of tutoring, uh, additional reading assignments maybe, or just another instructor or another person that can communicate more effectively with them. Maybe you've tried to teach them a certain skill and you try three different ways and you're totally out of it and you bring in another instructor and have he or she come in and maybe they can convey in a slightly different way that clicks for that student. So when we're talking about our article, students may fear not knowing how to study appropriately, being ridiculed by the instructor or classmates, and, and I tell you, we've often said you gotta have tough skin if you're in public safety, because I tell you, it seems around the firehouse or around uh, the ambulance, you know, um, they cut jokes and rag on one another. But you gotta understand, some students don't do well with that, and they feel pressure from it, and they can't perform as expected. Uh, maybe they're so worried about failure or getting made fun of that they have a vapor lock. Uh, again, maybe uh, personal matters unresolved while spending you know long hours in the classroom sitting. You know, maybe they're having trouble at home because uh, again, when you start having adult learners and you're putting them in a classroom for 40 hours a week, maybe they're worried about paying their bills, maybe they're having trouble with their spouses, uh, things are getting neglected, and they really just start focusing on that, which again can create a negative effect on the learning environment. Other things to think about that you can control pretty rarely is long stretches of time without a break to either sit or stand. You know, the old adage, the brain can only uh, absorb as much as the ass can take uh, kind of thing. So make sure you take breaks. And of course, with videos, I'm hoping you're pausing it and taking a break. I know I've taken a few breaks uh, recording just this lecture alone. Look at your lighting. Again, do you have poor lighting? Is it stuffy in there? Do you have poor ventilation? Um, you know, do you have other classmates that got that serious BO thing going on that, you know, you may want to, you know, discuss with them in private? Or not do what one uh, classmate did, their table mate. Uh, uh, they were coming in after PT and shower and all that. and. Um, we were getting ready for lecture, and someone had left a can of Axe body spray in front of this uh, individual. Uh, of course, the class got a chuckle out of it, and I'm sure that student didn't uh, exactly care for it, but I guess they were trying to convey um, it's a distraction. Uh, you don't smell like a bed of roses. Other things to think about, poorly organized training grounds or dangerous conditions. If you're on the field training, you gotta have people active. You gotta have them engaged. You know, if you're doing ladders, make sure you have enough ladders and you got three or four people per group as opposed to having two people uh, actually doing something with that piece of equipment or say the ladder and 18 people watching. Because again, they're gonna start getting bored because they're not doing anything and they're going to start thinking about other things or you know maybe hitting uh social media or some other electronics and i'll let you guys uh, and gals deal with that how you want on your on your social media and electronic policies but again have enough stuff and keep people moving and keep it organized the better organized it is the more you keep it moving the better effective the training is going to be as an instructor, you should plan intervals to allow opportunities to practice these new skills. Of course, interact with training aids and provide a variety of teaching methods. So when you're teaching, you know, have breaks in there, you know, talk a little bit, get up and do it. Or, you know, once you've trained on it one week, incorporate it into another evolution. You know, it can be something as simple as, okay, 
we're building up to live fire training and how we operate on the fire ground. So um, we talked about ladders last week. So um, this week we're talking about above grade fires. So let's incorporate using a ladder, advancing a hose line and going through a window to do attack. So again, we're giving them an opportunity to keep practicing the skills they've already learned. Again, back to the plateaus. All the stuff here listed are things to consider. Sometimes students create their own plateau because of emotional reason. Some students stay there only briefly before they break through that plateau and continue to excel. And a learning plateau can be compared to the landing on a flight of stairs. It is a break in the upward progression. So to help with these plateaus, after a student masters the procedural steps of a skill, they need to practice it until they meet their desired skill level. And of course, once they reach that level, they will be exposed to more information and skills and experiences to progress to the next skill level. Always build on what you've learned before and always try to incorporate it to better help your students break through the plateau because you don't want them to become discouraged and they find it more difficult to reach a particular skill level they want so then they start feeling like they just want to quit hang it up why uh, am i even here so students must be coached and receive again positive feedback as they practice the skill so they feel like they're getting better that they're overcoming so i always recommend saying okay um you're grading a test, for example, and how many times when you grade a test, you always see at the top, you know, negative 16 or negative 80, negative 50. And instead of putting that negative there, why not put a positive spin? For example, like you had a 50 question test, they got one right, so they got two. What about a plus two? You know, as opposed to, you know, a negative 98. And, you know, that's a total different spin from what they're used to. If they're used to, oh, I'm getting negative, this is bad. Well, let's put a positive spin on it. Hey, you know what's great? You got one right. That's one out of 49 that we don't have to worry about because you got it right. So what are we going to do to get the four other 49 questions correct? And that is really going to change the uh, the demeanor and the per, um, perception of the student. Now, instructors should let students know that learning plateaus are normal and help them recognize the signs of frustration when it comes to these plateaus and help them work to overcome the problem. Review your method of instruction to ensure they are able to communicate and demonstrate effectively. Okay, gang, we're now on the home stretch. Last objective, number seven. Discuss motivation as it relates to student success. Now, how instructors can help motivate students, and one is, of course, providing relevance. Set goals for the students that are realistic and attainable, and of course, demonstrate enthusiasm when you're teaching the subject. Expect success and require outstanding performance from your students. You may want to incorporate motivators such as, you know, the, the group that does the skill the fastest, doesn't have to do PT tomorrow or gets out of evening cleanup, whatever the case may be. Generate interest and participation from the students. Get them engaged. Uh, have somebody demonstrate. Ask somebody questions. Do different people. Um, vary your instruction techniques. Again, get your students involved. And the more you get them involved, the better off they're going to do and the better class you're going to have. Okay, gang, we covered a lot in chapter two.
So make sure you've read the chapter and done the review questions. And there's a few other helpful links here in Blackboard um, to cover in depth more of the mature we talked about. So if you have any questions, again, feel free to give me a call in the office or send me an email at aroberts at athenstech.edu. Okay, gang, so in closing, have you thunderstruck?